The Black Country, being an excerpt from Rides on Railways, by Samuel Sidney. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. Preface the following pages are an attempt to supply something amusing, instructive, and suggestive to travellers who, not caring particularly where they go or how long they stay at any particular place, may wish to know something of the towns and districts through which they pass, on their way to Wales, the lakes of Cumberland, or the highlands of Scotland, or to those who, having a brief vacation, may wish to employ it among pleasant rural scenes and investigating the manufactures, the mines, and other sources of the commerce and influence of this small island and great country. In performing this task, I have relied partly on personal observation, partly on notes and the memory of former journeys, and, where needful, have used the historical information to be found in cyclopedias and local guide-books. This must account for, if it does not excuse, the unequal space devoted to districts with the equal claims to attention, but it would take years, if not a lifetime, to render the manuscript of so discursive a work complete and correct. I feel that I have been guilty of many faults of commission and omission, but if the friends of those localities, to which I have not done justice, will take the trouble to forward to me any facts or figures of public general interest, they shall be carefully embodied in any future edition, should the book, as I hope it will, arrive at such an honour and profit. S.S. London, August 1851 The Black Country Walsall, Dudley, Wensbury, Darleston The first diverging railway, after leaving Birmingham, on the road to the north, is what, for want of a better name, is called the South Staffordshire, which connects Birmingham with Dudley, Walsall, Lichfield, and Tamworth, thus uniting the most purely agricultural with the most thoroughly manufacturing districts, and especially with that part of the great coal-field which is locally known as the Black Country. In this Black Country, including West Bromwich, Wensbury, Dudley and Darleston, Bilston, Wolverhampton, and several minor villages, a perpetual twilight reigns during the day, and during the night fires on all sides light up the dark landscape with a fiery glow. The pleasant green of pastures is almost unknown. The streams, in which no fishes swim, are black and unwholesome. The natural dead flat is often broken by huge hills of cinders and spoil from the mines. The few trees are stunted and blasted. No birds are to be seen, except a few smoky sparrows, and for miles on miles a black waste spreads around, where furnaces continually smoke, steam engines thud and hiss, and long chains clank, while blind gin-horses walk their doleful round. From time to time you pass a cluster of deserted, roofless cottages of dingiest brick, half swallowed up in sinking pits or inclined to every point of the compass, while the timbers point up like the ribs of a half-decayed corpse. The majority of the natives of this Tartarian region are in full keeping with the scenery, savages without the grace of savages, coarsely clad in filthy garments with no change on weekdays and Sundays. They converse in a language belarded with fearful and disgusting oaths, which can scarcely be recognised as the same as that of civilised England. On working days few men are to be seen. They are in the pits or the ironworks. But women are met on the high road, clad in men's once-white linsey-woolsey coats and felt hats, driving and cursing strings of donkeys laden with coals or iron rods for the use of the nailers. On certain rare holidays these people wash their faces, clothe themselves in decent garments, and since the opening of the South Staffordshire Railway take advantage of cheap excursion trains, go down to Birmingham to amuse themselves and make purchases. It would be a useful lesson for any one who is particularly well satisfied with the moral, educational, and religious state of his countrymen to make a little journey through this black country, 
he will find that the amiable enthusiasts who meet every May at Exeter Hall to consider on the best means of converting certain aboriginal tribes in Africa, India, and the islands of the Pacific, need not go so far to find human beings more barbarous and yet more easily reclaimed. The people of this district are engaged in coal-mining, in ironworks, in making nails and many other articles, or parts of articles, for the Birmingham trade. Their wages are, for the most part, good. Fuel is cheap. Well-supplied markets and means of obtaining the best clothing are close at hand. But within sixty years a vast, dense population has been collected together in districts which were but thinly inhabited, as long as the value lay on the surface, instead of in the bowels of the earth. The people gathered together, and found neither churches, nor schools, nor laws, nor customs, nor means for cleanliness at first, nor even an effective police to keep order and thus they became one of the most ignorant, brutal, depraved, drunken, unhealthy populations in the kingdom, unless it be a set of people in the same occupations in the neighbourhood of Manchester. We shall never forget, some five-and-twenty years ago, passing near Bilston on a summer's holiday, and seeing a great red-pied bull foaming and roaring, and marching round a ring in which he was chained, while a crowd of men, each with a demoniacal-looking bulldog in his arms, and a number of ragged women with their hair about their ears, some of them also carrying bulldog pups, yelled about the baited bull. He gave us an awful fright, and haunted our childish dreams for years after. The first change forced upon the governing classes, by feelings of self-protection, was an organised police, and the black people are now more disgusting than dangerous. The cholera of 1832, which decimated Bilston and Wensbury, did something towards calling attention to the grievous social and sanitary wants of this district. In that pestilence several clergymen and medical men died like heroes in the discharge of their duties. Some churches were built, some schools established, but an immense work remains to be done. Bull-baiting has been put down but no rational amusements have been substituted for that brutal and exciting sport. In the northern coal-fields, near Newcastle and Hontyne especially, we have noticed that when the miner ascends from the pit in the evening, his first care is to wash himself from head to foot, then to put on a clean suit of white flannel. As you pass along the one street of a pitman's village, you will see the father reading a chamber's journal or a cheap religious magazine at the door of his cottage, while smoking a pipe and nursing a child or two on his knee, and through the open door a neat four-post bed and an oak or mahogany chest of drawers bear witness to his frugality. In Wensbury, Bilston, and all that district, when work is over, you will find the men drinking in their dirty clothes and with grimy faces at the beer-shop of the butty, that is to say, the contractor or middleman under whom they work, according to the system of the country, and the women hanging about the doors of their dingy dwellings, gossiping or quarrelling, the old furies and the young slatterns. In the face of such savagery, so evidently the result of defective education, two opposite and extreme parties in the state, the anti-church Miles, and the pro-church Anthony Denison's combine to oppose the multiplication of education that teaches decency if it teaches nothing else. One great step has been made by the Health of Towns Act, which is about to be applied to some of these coal towns, and railways have rendered the whole district so accessible that no foul spot can long remain unknown or unnoticed. Walsall Eight miles from Birmingham, the first town on our way, which may be reached directly by following the South Staffordshire, or by an omnibus, travelling half a mile from Bescot Bridge, lies among green fields, out of the bounds of the mining country, although upon the edge of the Warwickshire and Staffordshire coal-field. Indeed, the parliamentary borough includes part of the rough population just described. It is very clean, without antiquities or picturesque beauties, and contains nothing to attract visitors except its manufactures, of which the best known is cheap saddlery for the American, West Indian, and Australian markets. They make the leather and wooden parts, as well as stirrups and bridles. Also, 
Gunlocks, bits, spurs, spades, hinges, screws, files, edge tools, and there is one steel pen manufactory, besides many articles connected with the Birmingham trade, either finished or unfinished, the number of which is constantly increasing. Walsall is celebrated for its pig market, a celebrity which railroads have not destroyed, as was expected, but rather increased. Special arrangements for comfortably disembarking these, the most interesting strangers who visit Walsall, have been made at the railway station. The principal church, with a handsome spire, stands upon a hill, and forms a landmark for the surrounding country. The ascent to it, by a number of steps, has, according to popular prejudice, produced an effect upon the legs of the inhabitants more strengthening than elegant, which has originated the provincial phrase of Walsall legged, but this is no doubt a libel on the understandings of the independent borough. The houses are chiefly built of brick, but it seems as if some years ago the inhabitants had been seized with an architectural disease which has left its marks in the shape of an eruption of stucco porticoes and one or two pretentious mansions, externally resembling jails or infirmaries, internally boasting halls which bear the same proportion to the living-rooms as Falstaff's gallon of sack to his halfpenny worth of bread. No doubt there are persons whom this style of house exactly suits. The portico represents their pride, the parlour their economy. What was intended for the Walsall Public Library consists of a thin closet behind a gigantic ionic portico, now tottering to its fall, and in like manner a perfectly dungeon-like effect has been given to the principal hotel by another portico, which affords a much better idea of the charges than of the accommodation to be found within. As a general rule in travelling, we pass by all hotels with porticos, to take refuge in more modest green dragons or blue boars. Walsall has a municipal corporation of six aldermen and eighteen councillors. The Reform Bill, to increase the troubles of this innocent borough, placed it in Schedule B, and gave it the privilege of making one Member of Parliament. Fierce contests at every general election have been the result, in which some blood, much money, and more beer have been expended. But neither party has thought it worth while to make the education of the savages of the black country a piece of politics, and if anyone did, he would only be torn to pieces between church and dissenters. Dudley, in Worcestershire, about six miles from Walsall by the South Staffordshire Railway, has a castle, and more than one legend for the antiquarian, a cave and limestone pits full of fossils for the geologist, and especial interest for the historical economist, being the centre of the district where the first successful attempts were made to smelt iron by coal, a process which has contributed almost as much as our success in textile manufactures, to give this small island a wealth and power which a merely agricultural non-exporting community could never have attained. Iron was manufactured with charcoal in England from the time of the Romans till the middle of the eighteenth century, when the timber of many counties had been entirely exhausted by the process. In 1558, in the reign of Elizabeth, it was enacted that no timber of the breadth of one foot square at the stub and growing within fourteen miles of the sea, or any part of the river Thames or Severn, or any other river, creek, or stream, by the which carriage is commonly used by boat or other vessel to any part of the sea, shall be converted to coal or fuel for making iron. And in 1581 a further act was passed to prevent the destruction of timber. For remedy whereof it was enacted that no new iron works should be erected within twenty-two miles of London, nor within fourteen miles of the River Thames, nor in the several parts of Sussex near the sea therein named. This act, not to extend to the woods of Christopher Durrell in the parish of Newdigate, within the Weald of Surrey, which woods have been coppiced by him for the use of his iron works in those parts. At the same period we find from a letter in the Stradling correspondence that while iron was made in Surrey, Sussex, and Kent, where not a pound is now manufactured, in Glamorganshire, at present a great seat of iron manufacture, iron was so scarce that an anvil was leased out at the rent of three shillings and fourpence a year, 
a rent at which, taking the then value of money, a very tolerable anvil could now be purchased. When the woods of the kingdom began to be exhausted, attention was turned to pit-coal, which had long been in use for fuel in the counties where it was plentifully found. A curious account of the first successful experiments is to be found, told in very quaint language, in the Metallum Martis of Dudley Dudley, son of Lord Edward Dudley, an ancestor of the late Earl Dudley and Ward, and of the present Lord Ward, who now enjoys the very estates referred to, and derives a princely income from the mineral treasures, the true value of which was discovered by his unfortunate ancestor, published in the reign of Charles the Second. This Mr. Dudley was an early victim of the patent laws, which to this day have proved to be for the benefit of lawyers and officials, and the tantalization of true inventors and discoverers. The following extracts contain his story, and enable us to compare the present with the then state of iron manufacture. Having former knowledge and delight in iron works of my father's, when I was but a youth, afterwards, at twenty years old, was I fetched from Oxford, then of Balliol College, anno 1619, to look after and manage three iron works of my father's, one furnace and two forges in the chase of Pensnell in Worcestershire, but wood and charcoal growing very scanty, and pit coals in great quantities abiding near the furnace did induce me to alter my furnace, and to attempt by my new invention the making of iron with pit-coal, and found at my trial or blast facere est adere inventioni. After I had proved by a second blast and trial the feasibility of making iron with pit-coal and with sea-coal, I found by my new invention the quality good and profitable, but the quantity did not exceed above three tons a week. After this the inventor obtained a patent from King James I for thirty-one years in the nineteenth year of his reign. But the year following the grant there was so great a flood of rain, to this day called the great May-day flood, that it ruined the author's ironworks and inventions, and at a market-town called Sturbridge, in Comitatu Vigoniae, one resolute man was carried from the bridge in the daytime. As soon as the author had repaired his works, he was commanded to send all sorts of bar iron up to the Tower of London, fit for the making of muskets and carbines. And the iron being so tried by artists and smiths, that the ironmasters and ironmongers who had complained that the author's iron was not merchantable, were silenced until the twenty-first of King James. At the then Parliament all monopolies were made null, and divers of the ironmasters endeavoured to bring the invention of making iron with pit-coal within the compass of a monopoly. But the Lord Dudley and the author did prevail, yet the patent was limited to continue but fourteen years. This exception in the statute of monopolies, which incontestably proves the claim of the Dudley family to the honour of having invented the art of smelting iron with coal, runs in the following terms provided also that this act shall not extend to, or be prejudicial to, a grant or privilege for the melting of iron ewer, and of mauling the same into sea-coals or pit-coals, by His Majesty's letters patent under the great seal of England, made or granted to Edward Lord Dudley. After the passing of the act, it seems that Dudley Dudley made great store of iron, and sold it at twelve pounds a tonne, and also cast iron-wares, as brewing systems, pots, mortars. But, being ousted of his works, he set up again a furnace at Himley, in the county of Stafford. Himley Hall is the present residence of Lord Ward, the representative of the Dudley family. From that time forward, the life of the unfortunate inventor was but one series of misfortunes. Under Charles I he got into lawsuits, was the victim of riots set on by the charcoal ironmasters, and was eventually lodged in prison in the Compter. Then came the Great Rebellion, during which he had the disadvantage of being a royalist as well as an inventor, and of having Cromwell, with Major Wildman and many of his officers, as opponents in rival experiments tried in the Forest of Dean, where they employed an ingenious glassmaster, Edward Dagney, an Italian then living in Bristow. But they failed and so he was utterly ruined. On the accession of Charles the Second, he petitioned, and eventually sent in the statement from which the preceding extracts have been made, 
but apparently without any success. The king was too busy making dukes and melting the louis d'or of his French pension to think of anything so common as iron or so tiresome as gratitude. The iron manufacture, for want of the art of smelting by coal and of a supply of wood, which the march of agriculture daily diminished, dwindled away, until, in the middle of the eighteenth century, it was revived at Colebrook Dale by the Derbys. In the intermediate period we were dependent on Russia, Spain, and Sweden for the chief part of the iron used in manufactures. But one of the most curious passages in Dudley's Metallum Martis is the following picture of the Dudley coal-field. Now let me show you some reasons that induced me to undertake these inventions. Well knowing that within ten miles of Dudley Castle there be near twenty thousand smiths of all sorts, and many ironworks within that circle decayed for want of wood, yet formerly a mighty woodland country. Secondly, Lord Dudley's woods and works decayed, but pit-coal and ironstone or mines abounding upon his lands, but of little use. Thirdly, because most of the coal-mines in these parts are coals ten, eleven, and twelve yards thick. Fourthly, under this great thickness of coals are many sorts of ironstone mines. Fifthly, that one-third part of the coals gotten under the ground are small, when the colliers are forced to sink pits for getting of ten yards thick, and are of little use in an inland country, unless it might be made use of by making iron therewith. Sixthly, these colliers must cast these coals and slack out of their ways, which, becoming moist, heat naturally, and kindle in the middle of these great heaps, often setting the coal-works on fire, and flaming out of the pits, and continue burning like Etna in Sicily, or Hecla in the Indies. At present, for more than ten miles round Dudley Castle, iron-works of one kind or another are constantly at work. No remains of mighty woodland are to be found. The value of the ten-yard coal is fully appreciated, but the available quantity is far from having been worked out. The untouched mineral wealth of Lord Ward in this district was valued ten years ago at a million sterling. The small coal is no longer wasted, but carefully raised from the pits, and conveyed by the numerous canals, tram-roads, and railroads, to iron-works, glass-works, and chemical-works. But still heaps of waste, moistened by rain, do smoke by day, and flaming by night in conjunction with hundreds of fiery furnaces, and natural gases blazing, do produce on a night's journey from Dudley to Wolverhampton not the effect of one Etna or Hecla, but of a broad inferno, from which even Dante might have gathered some burning notions. The political croakers who are constantly predicting that the last inevitable change, whether it be municipal corporation reform, a tithe commutation, or a corn tax repeal, will prove the ruin of England, should study the geographical march of our manufactures, and mark, how, on the whole population, the rise of a new staple in one district, or the invention of a new art, constantly creates a new demand for labour. The exhaustion of our forests, instead of destroying, founded one great element of our worldwide commercial influence. We make no apology for this digression, knowing that to many minds facts connected with the rise of the iron trade will have as much interest as notes on the scene of a battle or the birthplace of a second-rate poet. Besides, as we omit to say what we do not know, it is necessary that we should say what we do. Besides mining and smelting iron ore, a considerable population in and around Dudley is engaged in the manufacture of glass and of nails, the latter being a domestic manufacture, at which men, women, and children all work at home. The castle dates from a Saxon prince, Dodo, A.D. 700, but like the bird of the same name, the original building is extinct. But very interesting ruins of a Norman gateway, tower, and keep are in existence, and form with the caves a show-place leased by the South Staffordshire as an attraction to their excursion trains. The caves are lighted up on special occasions, and were honoured by a visit from the geologists of the British Association, when last they met at Birmingham. A fossil, called the Dudley Locust, is found in great quantities and varieties in the limestone quarries, which form part of the mineral wealth of the neighbourhood. 
the broad-gauge line through Birmingham and Oxford will shortly afford Dudley a direct and rapid communication with London. To passengers this will be a great convenience, but a mode of conveyance so unwieldy, clumsy, and costly is singularly ill-fitted for a mineral district, as experience among the narrow tramways of the North has amply proved. Dudley returns one member to Parliament, whose politics must, it is supposed, be those of the holder of the ward estate. Returning from Dudley through Walsall to Bescot Bridge, the rail pursues its course through a mining country to Bilston and Wolverhampton. On the road we pass in sight of the Birmingham Canal, one of the finest works of the kind in the kingdom. An enormous sum was spent in improving this navigation, in order to prove that any railway was unnecessary. The proprietors, under the influence of their officials, a snug family party, shut their eyes, and spent their money in opposing the inevitable progress of locomotive power to the last possible moment. Even when the first London and Birmingham railway was nearly open, a scheme for a new canal was industriously hawked round the county, and although there were not enough subscribers found to execute the work, a small percentage was sufficient to furnish a surveyor's new house very handsomely. Still, there is no probability of the canal ever ceasing to be an important aid to the coal trade in heavy freights. Wensbury, pronounced Wedgbury, and spelt Wednesbury in Doomsday Book, stands at the very heart of the coal and iron district, and is as like Tipton, Darlaston, Bilston, and other towns where the inhabitants are similarly employed, as one sweep is like another. Birmingham factors depend largely on Wedgbury for various kinds of ironwork and heavy steel toys. The coal-pits in the neighbourhood are of great value, and there is no better place in the kingdom to buy a thoroughbred bulldog that will kill or die on it, but never turn tail. The name is supposed to incorporate that of the Saxon god Woden, whose worship consisted in getting drunk and fighting, and to this day that is the only kind of relaxation which many of the inhabitants ever indulge. The church stands upon a hill, where Ethelfleda, Lady of Mercia, built a castle to resist the Danes, A.D. 914, about the time that she erected similar bulwarks at Tamworth and other towns in the Midland counties, but there are no antiquities worth the trouble of visiting. Parties who take an interest in the progress of education in this kingdom, among those classes where it is most needed, that is to say, masses of miners and mechanics, residing in districts from which all the higher and most of the middle classes have removed, where the clergy are few, hard-worked and ill-paid, where the virtues of a thinly peopled agricultural district have been exchanged for the vices, without the refinements of a crowded town population, should traverse this part of Staffordshire on foot. They will own that, in spite of the praiseworthy labours of both church and dissent, in spite of the progress of temperance societies and savings banks, a crowd of children are daily growing up, in a state of ignorance, dirt, and degradation fearful to contemplate. To active philanthropists, not to seekers of the picturesque, archaeologists and antiquarians, do we address ourselves. Still, we ought to add that in the ironworks and rolling mills there are studies of half-naked men in active motion at night, with effect of red firelight and dark shade, in which the power of painting flesh and muscular development might be more effectively displayed than in the perpetual repetition of model eaves and sprawling nymphs. Wolverhampton formerly lay away from railroads at a convenient omnibus distance, but competition has doubly pierced it through and through. One line connects it with Shrewsbury, another on the point of completion will connect it with Dudley, Birmingham and Oxford, and another with Worcester. Add to these means of communication the canals existing before railroads commenced, extending to Hull, Liverpool, Chester and London, and it will be seen that Wolverhampton is most fortunately placed. The great railway battle of the gauges commenced at Wolverhampton, and has been carried on ever since at the cost of more than a million sterling in legal and parliamentary expenses, besides the waste of capital in constructing three railways where one would have been sufficient, and the extra cost of land traversed where a price was paid, first for the land, second for the revenue, third for compulsion, fourth for influence, and fifth for vote, if the landowner were a member of either House of Parliament. 
At the end of the battle a competing line to London has been established, which will end shortly in a compromise, and if one district has two railways, others, much needing, have none. The shareholders on both sides have lost their money, the engineers have reaped a harvest, and the lawyers have realised a fortune. The experience of water companies, gas companies, canal companies, and railway companies has distinctly been that between great moneyed corporations with large capitals sunk in plant, competition is impossible and must end in a compromise. But these contests are profitable to lawyers, who must always win, whether their clients do or not. It is no exaggeration to say that as surely as Spain and Portugal are priest-ridden, so surely is Great Britain lawyer-ridden. No sooner does the science, the industry, and the enterprise of the country carve out some new road to commercial prosperity, than the attorney sets up a turnpike upon it and takes toll. And, if dispute arises as to the right of road, however the contest be decided, it ends in two attorneys taking toll. In chancery, in the laws affecting patents of inventions, in the laws affecting canals, in railways, a standing army of lawyers are constantly engaged in fighting battles, which end in our bearing the wounds and their sharing the spoil. So it was in these battles of the gauges. But to return to Wolverhampton, the name of which recalled battles wherein so much useful money has been wasted, the town, although of rising importance in a commercial point, offers no other attraction to the curious traveller than its numerous manufactories of hardware and machinery of various kinds, including firearms, tindware, locks and keys of extraordinary cheapness, gun-locks, files, screws, and japanned ware. The tea trays and other japanned ware of Wolverhampton are equal in taste and execution to anything produced in Birmingham. Indeed, it was at the manufactory of the Messrs. Walton that the plan of skilfully copying the landscapes of our best artists on Japan were originated. The first tea-tray of the kind was copied from one of Turner's Rivers of France, by a gentleman who has since taken up a very important position in applying the true principles of art to British manufactures. Wolverhampton and all the towns and villages in the coal and iron district are only so many branch Birminghams. In that hardware metropolis the greater part of the goods made are ordered and sold. The town is of great antiquity, although with as few remains as most flourishing towns built of brick, where manufacturers have chased away mansions. The name is derived from Wolfrana, a sister of King Edgar, who founded a monastery there in A.D. 996, and collected a village round it, named Wolfrana Hampton which was eventually corrupted into Wolverhampton. In the oldest church, St. Peter's, there is a pulpit, formed of a single stone, elaborately sculptured, and a font, with curious bas-relief figures of saints. The church is collegiate, and the college consists of a dean, who holds the prebend of Wolverhampton, which was annexed by Edward IV to his free chapel of St. George, within the castle of Windsor. A free grammar school, supported by endowments, affords a headmaster four hundred pounds a year, the second master two hundred, and a third master one hundred and twenty pounds. Some years ago these gentlemen had only seventy scholars to teach, but we trust this is or will be amended. Wolverhampton was made a parliamentary borough by the Reform Act, returning two members from boundaries which include the townships of Bilston, Willenhall, Wensfield, and the parish of Sedgley the population has increased more than fivefold in the last forty years. Bird, the artist, Congreve, inventor of the rockets which bear his name, and Abernethy, the eminent surgeon, were natives of Wolverhampton. Huskisson, who began the commercial reforms which Peel finished, was born at Oxley Hall in the immediate neighbourhood. Close to the town is a good racecourse, well frequented once a year, formerly one of the most fashionable meetings in the country. The ladies' division of the grandstand used to be a complete parterre of the gayest flowers, but railroads which have added to the quantity have very much deteriorated the quality of the frequenters of races, and unless a change takes place, a grandstand will soon be as dark, as busy, and as dull as the stock exchange. From Wolverhampton, a line nineteen miles in length, through Albrighton, where Staffordshire ends and Shropshire begins, 
and Schiffnell to Wellington shortens the route to Shrewsbury by cutting off an angle, but as there is nothing to be said about this route, except that at all Brighton are the kennels of the hunt of that name, a hunt in which the greater or less luxury and horse-flesh of the young iron-masters affords a thermometer of the state of the iron trade, we shall on this occasion take the Stafford line. Within an easy distance of Wolverhampton are a very large number of the noblemen's and gentlemen's seats in which Staffordshire is so rich. More than one ancient and dilapidated family has been restored by the progress of smoke-creating manufactures, which have added to the wealth even more than they destroy the picturesqueness of the country. If we were conducting a foreigner over England, with the view of showing him the wealth, the power, and the beauties of our country, we should follow exactly the course we have hitherto pursued and after an exhausting inspection of the manufactories of the coal country should turn off the rail after leaving wolverhampton on our road to stafford and visit some of the beautiful mansions surrounded by that rich combination of nature and art which so eminently distinguishes the stately homes of england for instance before reaching penkridge we pass on the right hand moseley court where the ancestors of the proprietors, the Whitgreaves, concealed Charles the Second after the Battle of Worcester. On the left, Rotesley Hall, the seat of the scientific nobleman of that name, and Chellington Park, the residence of the ancient Roman Catholic family of the Giffords, where an avenue of oaks, the growth of centuries with a magnificent domain stocked with deer and game, afford the admirers of English scenery delicious vistas of wood, water, and rich undulating pasture. The contrast between the murky atmosphere and continued roar of the iron-making country and the silence of the deer-haunted green glades is most striking and most grateful to eye and ear. As we rush along the valley of the Pink, too rapidly to drink in its full beauties, on the right Tedsley Hall, the mansion of Lord Hatherton, rising above the tops of the trees, reminds us that the noble lord's farms are well worth a visit from any one taking an interest in agriculture. Poor land has been rendered comparatively fertile, and by a complete system of drainage mere marshy rush-growing meadows have been made capable of carrying capital root and wheat crops, while the waste-water has been carried to a head, and then, by a large overshot water-wheel, working below the surface of the ground, made useful for thrashing, chaff, and root-cutting, and other operations of the farm. At Penkridge, a rural village of considerable antiquity, ten miles from Wolverhampton, adorned by a Gothic church and several picturesque houses of the Elizabethan style of domestic architecture, it will be convenient to descend, if an expedition is intended, over Cannock Chase, to Beaudesert, the seat of the Marquis of Anglesey. This Cannock Chase completes the singular variations of soil and occupation to be found in Staffordshire. From the densely populated iron districts, and the model agriculture of disciples of the same school of Lord Hatherton, we can turn our faces to a vast moorland, forty miles square, stretching from where it was first seen on the banks of the railway to the banks of the Trent, as wild as any part of Wales or Scotland intersected by steep hills, by deep valleys covered with gorse and broom, dotted with peat marshes, tenanted by wild deer and feathered game, and fed over by the famous Kenk sheep, nearly as wild as deer, and in flavour rivalling the best mountain mutton. This great waste was once covered with dense forests, in which the wolf, the bear, the wild boar, and the wild bull were hunted by our Saxon kings. It is not among the least wonders effected by the locomotive that a short hour can transport us from the midst of the busiest centres of manufactures to a solitude as complete as is to be found in the prairies of America or Australia, unless we by chance stumble upon a prying gamekeeper or an idle rustic seeking wattleberries or snaring hares. On this chase, begged by his ancestors from an easy king as a kitchen garden, the hero of the light cavalry at Waterloo annually takes his sport, mounted on a perfect shooting cob, and with eighty years upon his shoulders can still manage to bring down his birds right and left. Long may such blanks of solitude and wild nature remain among the busy hum of commerce to remind us of what all England once was, to afford at a few holidays in the year 
a free breathing space to the hard-working multitude, and to the poet and student that calm delight which the golden fragrance of a gorse-covered moor can bestow. Before we reach Stafford, we leave on the right, although not in sight, Shugborough, the deserted mansion of the Earl of Lichfield, a descendant of the Lord Anson, who sailed round the world, but was never in it. End of The Black Country by Samuel Sidney Recording by Andy Minter